Bombshell tonight. The FBI now called in to investigate the shooting death of Micah Miller, the glamorous wife of a local pastor who authorities say took her own life. Micah found dead in Lumber State River Park from a gunshot wound. Her family now urging authorities to further investigate the death. This, as we learn, his ex-wife said much the same. Reports now surfacing the pastor not only posted, wait for it, intimate photos of Micah, his wife, online, but then apologized for his evil question. Which evil? Good evening. I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thank you for being with us. She was so creative. Everything she did was so creative. What's the next picture? Okay. That is the estranged husband, uh, John Paul Miller. Uh, we have guinea pigs, and sometimes they hiccup, and they go... <coughs> that kind of sounds like that. That is seemingly very emotional video of the pastor at Solid Rock Ministries. He actually went on to deliver his wife's eulogy and is now claiming he tried to, quote, raise her from the dead. Now, I'm certainly not a Bible expert, but I can tell you, in the history of the earth, I've only known of one person that raised somebody from the dead, and it ain't him, okay? With me, an all-star panel to make sense of what we know right now. Um, hold on. I want you to hear it from the horse's mouth. Listen. I got this lay next to her body and been down with her body about four times this week. And each time, it still didn't hit me. Um, I thought she was going to wake up, you know. I even tried to raise her from the dead uh, one time this week. And, uh... Okay, she's not waking up. Why? Because this beautiful young preacher's wife is dead from a gunshot wound so far. We're not getting a lot of information about, for instance, trajectory path. Was a gunshot residue test run on her hands? What do we really know? We know there was a 911 call, but what more do we know? This is authorities insist this was a suicide, but friends and family insist they want the FBI to further investigate her death, and apparently that is happening. You were just seeing video from Solid Rock Ministries in a seemingly emotional eulogy. At this hour, the FBI reportedly opening an investigation after bombshells surrounding her death, including reports that her husband, John Paul Miller, posted, quote, intimate, I hate to think what that is, photos of his young wife online and then leaving no room for, hey, did he do it or not? He apologized for his, quote, evil. And I want to warn everybody on the panel that we have just gotten a letter from the Russell B. Long Attorneys at Law threatening everybody if they say anything that um, disparages the pastor. But you know, it's really interesting that his former wife got a divorce because she claimed the preacher was having an affair on her, including with the babysitter. Who's the babysitter? Micah. Okay, back to our panel joining me, a, a special guest right now. This is Micah's sister, Sierra. Sierra Francis with us. Sierra, first of all, we are so sorry about what you and your family are going through. A lot of us on the panel 
have been um, victims of violent crime, including myself. And I, I, I think the worst possible thing that could happen is to lose your child. You're suffering from losing your sibling. And what a beautiful, beautiful girl on the inside and the outside. Tell me about your sister. Micah was amazing. She was energetic. She was funny. She was always trying to make sure everybody around her was happy. And she was always trying to include everyone. Um, she was very passionate about her missions trips to Kenya um, and nutrition. She was just an all around wonderful, God fearing woman. When did she meet the preacher that became her husband? It would have been probably in 2007, 2008, when our family moved to Myrtle Beach. Um, collectively, our stepfather and mother moved our whole family there, and we began to attend Solid Rock when it was a smaller congregation of maybe 30, 40 people. How old was Micah at that time? Uh, probably around 13 or 14. Is that when she met the preacher, John Paul Miller, that she would marry? Yes, that would have been around that time. Is it true that at that time he, John Paul Miller, was her youth minister? Um, I believe so. I know that he was involved in pretty much every aspect of the church because it was such a small church. I'm very curious also about everything was said in the eulogy. You know what? I, I'm very curious about how all this is striking you, Sierra, uh, Micah's sister. Take a listen to this. While Micah Miller's family and friends hold service beachside for Micah, John Paul Miller delivers a eulogy for his estranged wife, Micah Miller, at Solid Rock at Market Common. Miller seems to cry without any tears while talking about how he tried to raise Micah from the dead claims he laid down with his wife about four times, and when he took a dog tag necklace Micah had given him to the mall to get it fixed, he saw a woman wearing Micah's dress with the same tattoo and hairstyle. He calls out, Micah! But it was her sister. Thought he had raised Micah from the dead. To Sister Sierra, did that really happen? It did, and uh, I was carrying my children at the time, and my son was very afraid, and he said, we have to go right now. Why was your son afraid? Because we're very open with my son. Micah has come to my house multiple times to get away from her estranged husband. So my son is very aware of the dangers surrounding him um, to the point where whenever Micah passed away and my son came home and I had to tell him that she had passed away, he said, this is all John Paul's fault. Um, I've had a lot of women that have reached out to me about um, situations of abuse. And I just wanna tell you what a lot of people have told me uh, lately and reminded me because I think I forgot. I knew, but I, for, I pushed it in the back of my head um, just because of my situation. Um, but you are the bride of Christ. God hates divorce. But why? According to everybody I've asked and the, the scriptures that I've found, it's because it hurts people. But does abuse hurt people? How do you think God feels about that? Joining me right now is uh, another special guest, Tracy Brown, who is a body language expert, author of How to Detect Lies, Fraud, and Identity Theft. You can find her at bodylanguagetrainer.com. Tracy, thank you so much for being with us. I know you have studied Pastor John Paul Miller's movements, his speech. I was referring earlier to the hiccups, which apparently was a facsimile of crying. And I also noticed that one of his assistants came out and gave him a box of hankies, and he went, no, nah, I don't need that, because there didn't seem to be any actual tears, just the <laughs> sounds. But I'm just a lay person. I'm just a trial lawyer. What do you, the body language experts, see? Well, we didn't see tears. We didn't see eye redness. And um, 
the most important thing that we saw is that the emotions, uh, the sadness got shut on and off like a light switch. And that's not how emotions work. Emotions are chemically based. And so they build slowly and they dissipate slowly. Like the chemicals have a half-life. And so this is the first indication of faked sadness here. Now, um, what's more important is when I profile people, I because I listen closely and I want to um, understand what does this person want me to know about them the most. And what he's doing throughout this whole eulogy is selling how much he has tried to please her over their life together and also what a good guy he is. So this, this is um, the subtext of this is more of a sales pitch about what a great person he is. Now, if we, di if we dive deep into his exact words, what he does throughout this, uh, and here's one of the statements, and this is a quote, everyone knew how beautiful she was on the outside, only a spouse. Okay. So he didn't say him. He said a spouse that's distancing. Only a spouse knows how beautiful that person is. That person again, distances, how beautiful that person is on the inside. So he has statements similar to this throughout the eulogy where he distances himself from her. He, another one is imagine being married to that, right? Which is another psychological, emotional distance statement that we see from him. And what's missing, because the other thing that I do when I profile people is I, I go, okay, what's missing here? What's missing are the typical things that you would hear in a eulogy from a, a husband, right? Which is how much he misses her, how shocked he is, because what he says is it hasn't hit me. He says it hasn't hit me. He says it uh, two to three times in there. And so we don't, see, he's not revealing any emotional attachment to what happened. Now, um, he, he also says that, um, he's, he's not, he's not talking about how much he loved her. He doesn't talk about any of those things that would be typical in a speech such as this. So all these things, um, really add up to someone who is not being genuine in their emotion. Now we don't have a smoking gun with what he said. I'd like to see an interview with him specifically about this, but like, like a police interview, which I haven't haven't seen, but, um, uh, we have some disturbing, uh, behavior here. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, isn't it true to Sierra? This is Micah's sister who is literally speaking to us through her tears, real tears. At one point he was trying to apologize for posting nude photos of her. I assume they were intimate. So I can only guess nude online and said he wanted to quote attack and cause pain for Micah. He, you know what? As many arguments as my husband and I have had over the years, especially since we had children, I've never wanted to hurt David. And I can honestly say he's never wanted to actually hurt me in any way, even when we're angry about some issue. But to write out, apologize for posting nude photos of your wife online and say, I'm sorry, I wanted to attack and cause you pain? Yes, that's very normal behavior for John Paul. He's, he's always done that Why to her. Why do you he's say very that? He's, that's what he always does. He, if he can't get his way, he will act as a child. He will throw a tantrum. He will cause a scene and he will make sure that the other person suffers. And like you said, there's emails proving it. Um, I've had a lot of women that have reached out to me about um, situations of abuse. And I just want to tell you what a lot of people have told me uh, lately and reminded me because I think I forgot. I knew, but I, for, I pushed it in the back of my head. Um, just because of my situation. Um, but you are the bride of Christ. God hates divorce, but why? According to everybody I've asked and the, the scriptures that I've found, it's because it hurts people. But does abuse hurt people? How do you think God feels about that? You know, I, I want our body language expert, Tracy Brown, the body language trainer, to listen to this more of the preacher. And remember everybody, 
He sent a legal threat letter stating, don't talk about me. Okay. Let's listen to the words from the horse's mouth. I can't wait to see her again one day. She was so creative. She just, it was just always just coming out of her. Imagine being married to that. <laughs> it was like that in our house all the time. Dear Lord in heaven. Okay. Um, uh, that is a seemingly emotional video from Solid Rock Ministries. You know, I've got so many questions for Sierra, but to our body language expert, Tracy, here's a few things I noticed having put literally thousands of witnesses on the stand for direct and cross-examination. For instance, the pacing back and forth, the smiling inappropriately during the eulogy, the wiping tears over and over that don't exist, the rubbing of the hands repeatedly throughout, the touching the head, touching the hair. There's nothing to adjust. His hair is like that long. What is he, what is he doing? Um, the clapping, the clapping, and the seemingly endless, <laughs> I don't know what, what is that? They're small, repetitive movements that uh, that we'll all do when we need to let off stress. So this is a high stress moment for him. Now, um, we also saw what I thought was really interesting, and what you don't see from a lot of preachers or a lot of people that are used to speaking, is his hand in his pocket. And I was I looked at it pretty closely, and it might even be in a fist. And his uh, and that that's when we're holding something back. We're holding back information, or we're holding back emotion. If that hand indeed is in a fist, that says anger. So um, all of these things add up to something that that um, our mind sees and it goes, wait a minute, something's not right here. Something's not right here. And that's because the emotions are not genuine. And, um, you know, I'm not going to speculate as to why they're not genuine, genuine, right? Body language tells you what's on someone's mind. It doesn't tell you why. You have to put together a list of that. And I think there's plenty of evidence that other folks have for that. But um, what we're seeing some is is dis we're seeing disingenuous behavior. I pray for your healing. The circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that I break through. What happened today? I pray miracles over your life. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Micah contacted police after her estranged husband posted an indecent photo of her on a Facebook group called Big Boobs and Nice Curves. Police told Micah since the photo was posted anonymously, there was nothing they could do. John Paul Miller apologized to Micah via email, telling her, I'm sorry for putting a picture of you on the internet. He added, I just wanted to try and hurt you. He also included, it was evil of me to do that. Evil of me to do that. Okay, curious. After an intimate photo of his wife, unclad, was posted online by him and he admits it, why no charges? But I don't understand why no charges, why no arrest, but that's not all. Listen. Just weeks before her death, Micah Miller calls police for help when she finds a tire on her car's flat. Police discover a tire deflator is used on the tire. Micah goes to East Coast Honda in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina to get a new tire where John Paul Miller shows up. The two get into an argument. Video shows John Paul Miller aggressively walking around Micah, threatening to post a picture online while Micah says, walk away. A mechanic later shows Micah a GPS tracking device had been placed on her car. I'm very disturbed about this. Kella Brantley joining us along with Micah's sister, Sierra Francis. Uh, Kella Brantley, investigative reporter, DailyMail.com. Kella, we have two incidents, one admitted, one observed, that they're both illegal, posting photos of a woman or anyone online where they are nude or partially nude against their consent is illegal. Placing a tracking device or cutting someone's car tires, illegal. Why no arrest, Kayla Brantley? 
Well, according to police, they allegedly told Micah that despite all this evidence, that the photo that she allegedly sent him, once you send a photo, it's now the, no longer your property and that now belongs to her husband. And also that in the photo, there was actually muzzing around any parts that would make it fully nude, which then means that it apparently does not count as revenge porn. So basically when Micah came to them, they told her that there was nothing that they could do. Okay, uh, to Regina Ward, she was the lawyer for Micah on the divorce proceeding now here with Micah's sister, Sierra. Regina, that's not true. When you post a photo of someone without their clothes on against their will, that's illegal. Yes. In more ways than one. Well, what I don't understand is why there weren't any charges. I guess that's my question to you. Why weren't there charges? Um, as far as I know on that, it's the police took the position that it was posted anonymously, as I understand, therefore not enough, quote, evidence to say that it was him. I don't think he made an admission until later. So it'd be interesting to see if they'll follow up now with that crime and pursue it. Sierra is joining me, Micah's sister. Sierra, your sister Micah never gave him permission to post that photo of her. He has apologized. He has apologized for the car incident. Why no charges? Um, like Regina said, I would hope that the police will follow up now that there is proof of these alleged crimes that he was keeping his hands clean of and, and making it so difficult for Micah to prove. And now that he's admitted that he did commit these crimes, I see no reason why they cannot hold him accountable at this point. To Brian Foley joining me, high-profile lawyer, former chief prosecutor, Harris County, Texas, and author of What Prosecutors Don't Tell You. Brian Foley, uh, let's just break it down. Typically, when somebody posts revenge porn, they won't send it from their account. They come up with a fake account. They do it at the public library some way that it can't be easily traced. But guess what? It can be traced. That's what the police or the sheriffs are supposed to do. Trace it and prosecute it. Not say, oh, it was anonymous. Sorry. That's not how it works, Foley. Well, in some instances, it's because the image itself doesn't qualify. Like, for example, in Texas, we have a rule that says the person's face has to be identifiable. You have to be able to say, it's a specific person. So if you cut out the face, it, it's no longer under that statute. It sounds like there was some blurring that happened to these photos in particular. And the police keep doing, you know, in the original investigation, and I guess in this uh, revenge porn investigation, they keep following the law, which I, as a defense attorney, I think it's a good thing that uh, they are not. Okay, hold on. Let's, let's find out more about that photo. Sierra Francis, this is Micah's sister. Tell me about the revenge porn that was posted of your sister. What was it? So John Paul had assumed basically Micah's identity while he had her hospitalized. He took her Facebook, her cell phone, her laptop, her iCloud. He took everything and he was pretending to be her, texting people, emailing people, posting on her behalf as though he was her. And at one point he posted a topless photo of her, her face in the picture, and he added some sort of hue over it. Like if you took a highlighter across the front of her chest, um, just to barely cover, you could still see what, what exactly what it was. But I guess he knew that since he posted it one off of Micah's account against her will without her permission, he thought he would get away with it. And up to this point he has. And there's the issue of the flat tires in the GPS tracking device, which he apologized for reportedly. Of course, he is claiming and insisting that he is not guilty. He has not been named as a person of interest or suspect in her death. Guys, I want to go on quickly to the bombshell now. The FBI reportedly being called in to investigate her death. To Sierra, this is Micah's sister, what is it you want the FBI to do? Um, 
So we know that Robeson County has said that the FBI is investigating, but we don't know exactly, you know, what their investigation will pertain to. I would love for them to go and investigate, you know, what the cops were able to discover and everything leading up to her passing away. Because as everyone has uncovered, there's a lot more to this story than what meets the eye. And even an earthly spouse, who's a good spouse, when they know that their bride is being hurt, just imagine what an earthly spouse does. What do you think your heavenly spouse does when you're the bride of Christ and he sees his bride going through abuse and hurt? What do you think he thinks about that? John Paul Miller's ex-wife, Allison Miller, filed for divorce from John Paul Miller after finding out he was having an affair with their babysitter and his best friend's wife, Micah. Micah Miller was married to John Paul Miller's best friend, Jeremy Deese, whom Micah married when she was just 18. Wow. Okay, so let me understand. To Kayla Brantley joining us, uh, investigative reporter with DailyMail.com, the other wife, the previous wife, Allison, I've been reading her affidavits in her divorce, and in her affidavits, she states that John Paul Miller, who... Uh, is threatening anybody that, let me see, defames him. So let's just commit to speaking the truth. I'm down with that. The first wife says that church leaders demanded he seek counseling for sex addiction, but when he refused, the majority of the church left the congregation. Uh, she also states that he was having multiple affairs and that do, trying to dodge alimony payments. He showed up in court in a wheelchair and claimed he fell out of a tree and broke both legs. That's the first wife. And I'm getting this from her affidavits and her claims. What about it, Kayla Brantley? Yeah, that's right, Nancy. So DailyMail.com, we obtained that affidavit and there were bombshells after bombshells in it. Now she accuses him of having a porn addiction, accuses him to have of having a prostitute addiction, a sex addiction, and apparently he did seek counseling or refused to seek counseling after the church pressured him to do so, which then led to a lot of his congregation leaving because obviously you don't want to have a pastor who's accused. She does also go on to say that Micah was their babysitter and that they started having you know a relationship while they were married and of course he's 14 years older than Micah so when she's saying that he groomed her if they did meet when she was 13 years old he's 14 years her senior an adult with children married and I want to point out in the legal letter that was sent to us by uh, the preacher's lawyer our client refutes any report that suggests he abused his wife. Recent reports claim Pastor Miller, quote, groomed his wife from the age of 10, that in fact she moved to Myrtle Beach at age 15. And I believe that is when he was her youth minister. Sierra, what went through your mind when you learned your sister had been shot? Uh, you know, instinctively, I just assumed that we, we would have an arrest and we would be able to finally um, have some closure of what, what she was dealing with and all the, the terror that she was living through. Um, and obviously we haven't gotten that and that's, that's pretty rough. Guys, we were speaking to Sierra Francis. This is Micah's sister. How did you discover your sister had been shot? Um, I got a call from my brother that Micah's roommate was trying to find out where Micah was. She said that police had showed up at her house because Micah did not live with John Paul. So the police showed up to his roommate's house or to, I'm sorry, to her roommate's house. And she then reached out to the family and my brother called me and said something's wrong. The police are at uh, Diana's house. We need to find Micah. So I immediately called another one of Micah's friends and she informed me that John Paul had said that Micah was dead. So I immediately called John Paul's sister because she lives at John Paul's house. 
and John Paul was on the phone with the hospital and he was seemingly hysterical. It sounded very fake. And he was saying, why would she do this, Sierra? Why was she sad? Who was she seeing in Lumberton? Micah's dead. And he was just going on and on. Um, and I said, are you joking, John Paul? You know exactly why she would have done this if it was her. And I said that you have been making her life hell for the past couple of months. And he hung up on me. Then he texted my family and Question said, this is what happens when you tell someone to divorce the man they love. This is, he said, good job, Francis family. And that's how the rest of my family found out that Micah passed away. Okay, wait, would you repeat that, please? I didn't know that. Yes, he sent a text message out to my parents and siblings. I'm not sure exactly who all was in the chat. It was a, a previous chat. He just pulled it up and he texted saying, this is what happens when you tell someone to divorce the man they love. Good job, Francis family. And that's how he informed, you know, my siblings and my parents that Micah had passed away. Again, he is not a suspect in the death of Micah. It has been ruled a suicide. Friends and family are begging the FBI to further investigate to Sierra Francis. I, I, I'm concerned, and this is what concerns me. The alleged revenge porn for which he apologized for doing it. The slashing of the tires, which reportedly he apologized for doing. The tracking device. All of that is illegal and no charges were ever brought. Do you trust the local investigation? What is your hope for the FBI? And again, the pastor has not been named a person of interest or suspect. What is your hope for the FBI, Sierra? I hope that they will pursue this and to the fullest of their legal you know, obligation instead of just Micah getting dead end after dead end after dead end every time she filed a police report, every time she called and asked them a question, hey, what can I do? How do I pursue this? She was getting basically, you know, doors shut in her face every single time. So I hope that now with the gravity of things and how extreme and how nationwide this has gotten, maybe they will look and see, you know, either one, they need to readdress some of their protocols. Or two, they need to look at their people and say, did you follow protocol and did you do your fullest extent or were you just not wanting to get involved because it's a marital dispute? Because obviously to her, it was a big deal. I pray for your healing. Circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee. In Jesus' name, I pray that I break through would happen today i pray miracles over your life in jesus name in jesus name um i've had a lot of women that have reached out to me about um situations of abuse and i just want to tell you what a lot of people have told me uh, lately and reminded me because I think I forgot. I knew, but I for, I pushed it in the back of my head um, just because of my situation. Um, but you are the bride of Christ. God hates divorce, but why? According to everybody I've asked and the, the scriptures that I've found, it's because it hurts people. But does abuse hurt people? How do you think God feels about that? You're hearing Micah Miller posting about the suffering and the pain she says she was going through. Reminder, authorities have not charged her husband in any way with her death. Joining me in All-Star Panel, but now special guest is with us, Alicia Young. Alicia is a very dear friend of Micah's and a former friend of John Paul Miller's, the estranged husband. Why are you considering yourself a former friend of John Paul Miller's? So during our time there, um, my husband was actually the worship leader when we were there. And so we were very close with them because we were in that inner circle. And when we left the church, our friendship um, between me and Micah got severed because of him. 
and um, our relationship with John Paul, we ended that because he didn't want to listen to anything that we had to say. Um, all the issues that we were seeing with him and the church, um, he just... What issues? He, so with how they treat women and how I got treated at the church is basically they celebrate men. And with women, women are only supposed to be seen and not heard. He didn't like when a woman had a strong opinion or was, you know, um, kind of outgoing in a way. Um, I was trying to find a different word. But it was all about the men in the church and that he would state in sermons of men, you just need to go find a hot wife um, because that's what matters. And with the women in the church, like I wasn't allowed to do anything in the church at all. He didn't want me on the platform to any capacity because of how I looked and because of how old I was. I was already in my 30s. I was heavier at the time and I wasn't some young 25 year old with a hot body. So he didn't want me at all on the platform. To Brian Foley joining us, our now defense attorney and former chief prosecutor Harris County, author of What Prosecutors Don't Tell You. Brian Foley, I think that authorities are dug in that this was a suicide, but I want you to listen to this. As carbon monoxide begins to fill his truck cabin, Conrad Roy III gets out, texting Michelle Carter, he'll do it another day. Carter texts to Roy are challenging, telling him he overthinks things. Carter texts Roy, you just said you were going to do it tonight, and now you're saying eventually? Carter tells Roy to get back in the truck. Conrad Roy III gets back in the truck. Authorities discover the body of Conrad Roy III in his pickup truck parked outside of Kmart in Fairhaven, Massachusetts the next day. He was 18. My point, Brian Foley, in that case and many others like it, which we have here to name for you if necessary, Michelle Carter was prosecuted and convicted for aiding and abetting the suicide of Conrad Roy. The texts and conversations she had with him, the messages are sickening, basically goading him to commit suicide. So my question to you is... Your thoughts on defending the pastor against claims he goaded Micah into committing suicide, like Michelle Carter and others. So first we start with, it sounds like everybody's on the same page. He didn't pull the trigger. He wasn't there. It was Micah who pulled the trigger, uh, ending her own life. Uh, if, we're, if we're that far, then the only question we have left is, as public policy, uh, are people responsible for the actions of others? And we have criminal culpability in some instances, if you're both committing a bank robbery, if you're actively engaged in it. JP was not actively engaged in it. We have information from her cell phone. The police have already released it. She looked up the area in that part of the uh, town. And uh, we're kind of assuming that he's both uh, bumbling around and can't keep things together and He's obviously lying on the, you know, at the pulpit. It's a suicide. And to hold somebody else responsible, you have to think, well, we're talking about JP and airing out all of his information. If he were to commit suicide, are we responsible for that? No way. Those are individual decisions. Uh, and the Conrad Roy case is also very different. I pray for your healing. Circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Welcome back, everybody. Listen to this. Um, I got a call late last night. My wife has passed away. And yeah, it was, uh, was self-induced, and it was uh, up in North Carolina. That is from our friends at Solid Rock Ministries, and a seemingly emotional uh, comment by her then-husband. They were not yet divorced. 
many people disagree with any such suggestion that there was emotion there. That said, reports the FBI are now entering the investigation. Kayla Brantley joining me, investigative reporter, DailyMail.com. What is it assumed the FBI can do? Well, Nancy, you're looking at everything that we said before. Why didn't the police get involved after there was a nude photo? Why didn't police get involved after the fact that he admitted allegedly to putting a tracker in her car or slashing her tire? So I think the FBI coming in is really going to push this case forward and potentially and hopefully do what the local police could not. You know, I'm, I'm curious, is it true to anyone's knowledge of what has been reported that he actually went into court in a wheelchair when he was fighting alimony payments and said that he fell out of a tree and broke both legs. Uh, Kayla Brantley, is that true? Well, that was one of the things that was mentioned in the report that we did get from 2017 from his ex-wife, Allison. Now, she mentioned that. She mentioned a lot of instances of abuse, of infidelity. So that's just one of many big issues that we're having here. And going back to Micah and the local police, she reported eight times in the months leading up to her death to police with clearly no nothing to be done. We await the entry and the involvement of the FBI in the investigation of not only Micah's death, but any related facts leading up to that moment. As of now, it has been ruled a suicide. And the husband, the estranged husband, John Paul Miller, has not been named a suspect. Let's stop and remember American hero, police officer Kevin Cram, just 33 shot and killed in the line of duty, survived by a grieving wife, Laura, and children, Archer and Weston, and Ira. American hero, police officer, Kevin Cram. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you to our MSM viewers, and thank you to our guests. Nancy Grace signing off. I'll see you tomorrow night, 6 and 9 o'clock sharp Eastern, and until then... Good night, friend. I pray for your healing. The circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee. In Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Guys, thank you for watching Crime Online with Nancy Grace here on YouTube. To get the very latest, subscribe to Crime Online here.